everyone welcome back to my channel um coming up is the second last video that I have from the videos that I was missing for the mosaic courses and it is a drill with me so enjoy and I will see you back after the video Hi everyone, welcome to Amber Zoodle Art. Um, I thought I would do this as a drill with me um, here, stop time lapse. And I can hear my dog running around in the background. She's getting super excited. I'm talking to someone. She probably thinks I'm on the phone with my mom, and she loves my mom. So if she comes in here howling, I'm really sorry. She's super, super energetic. I'm still waiting for the day when she actually calms down and <laughs> she's like six and a half and that day does not seem to be coming so that's what you get when you want to board a collie but I love her so anyway um that I would do this is a drill with me and just go through and finish off this section like that and let's see what happens uh, so the first, yes, Guinevere, yes, I know. So I'm going to start off with uh, d this uh, dun pencil, 315. This is the only one that I ended up going in multiple containers because I used my larger containers for ones that had more drills in it. So I only ended up with one color that it's over two. So I'm just going to open up the one that's not marked, pour it into a tray. And I did switch from the white tray to the green trays. I'm still only using one tray and the single drill pen. So then I'm basically using what um, a beginner would use when they um, get a kit. The only thing that's different is containers, so I don't like using the bags. I'm only using the tools that somebody just starting off with diamond painting might do. And this is kind of like, the symbol of this is, is two triangles that kind of, one's upside down and they're kind of touching in the middle. So, yeah, and I didn't prepare a tag or anything with this, so I'm just going to ramble, and I just I don't know. know what, yes, Guinevere, I know. My husband's at work today, so um, he works a 12-hour shift. He's going to be gone now for the next probably seven hours with the commute home um, but he does have to stop and pick some stuff up so it could be as long as eight hours so I've got lots of time to done and paint I got up this morning and was working on some stuff and then I decided to go back to bed because I actually got up with him and he got up at like 530 and yeah I was awake, so I stayed awake for a couple hours, and then I chose to go back to bed. And now the cats come into the room, too. Yes, my office is... Um, we have two dogs and a cat. And we've decided that it's not necessarily a good thing for them to be together when we're not home, when we're at work. So Guinevere are... Our smallest dog and when I say small she's a border collie but she's a half size border collie and she's really got the height of a general border collie but she's a very small slim uh, build so she if I'm lucky I can get her to weigh 30 pounds and the average border collie probably weighs about 45 so she's she's tiny 
and she's pretty good, although sometimes she does get bored, and when she gets bored, um, she can get very destructive. So she's in a crate during the day when we're gone. And then we have a Border Collie Ridgeback Cross, Abby, and she's 130 pounds. So we leave her out. She gets um, free reign to the bottom floor of the house. We do put a baby gate up across the stairs because she likes to come upstairs into the bedrooms and stuff, and she can get herself in some trouble. She's very curious. They're both very curious. And not only that, we find Abby's kind of a, she's a bit of a practical joker. She's, she's a sweetheart. Um, she's very nervous of people. And with her size and her being nervous of people, um, she doesn't back off. She's actually afraid of everyone she meets, but she doesn't back off for them. She almost, I call it her her silverback stomp. She kind of comes up to people and she acts all tough and aggressive and waits to see how people react to her. And if people react badly to her, like they act really scared and they back off and she's like, ooh, I have the upper hand. These people are afraid of me, so she plays it up more. Um, but generally, she is a sweetheart and she's She's kind of our joker. So what she likes to do, we bought um, a small wading pool. Because we're in a townhouse, so we have a front yard. So we put, bought a small wading pool at Canadian Tire that, you know, would be a child's pool. And we fill it with water. We put a, Well, we don't fill it with water. We, we put a bucket of water in it. Enough in the wind summer when it's hot that basically they can get a drink, they can climb in it, cool their feet off. Um, a lot of people don't realize this, but dogs actually cool themselves to their feet a lot and panting. They don't sweat like we do, so the pads of their feet and panting is how they cool themselves off. So it gives her a place where she can go stand in it. And it's hilarious because she can't lie in this pool. She's too big. She is, um, she's humongous. But she likes to sit in this pool. And Guinevere, our border collie, the purebred border collie, likes to, she drinks a lot. She drinks a ton. Like, this dog just drinks like mad. You put a bowl of water down and it's half gone. I don't know how she's not constantly asking to go outside to pee, but she just drinks. So we fill the pool with water, with a little bit of water, and Abby goes and sits in it, and poor Guinevere comes over and gets a drink, and Abby puts her paw on top of her head and pushes her head into the water. I have no idea where Abby picked this up. But Abby thinks it's fun. Of course, poor Guinevere. Guinevere doesn't like this. And I keep saying her name, so she keeps coming around and looking at me like, Mom, why are you calling me? But, yeah, Gwen doesn't like this. When Abby does stuff like this to her. And Abby does stuff like this to her all the time. Like, all the time. So... Um, and she's not as easygoing as Abby is. She's, she's kind of vindictive. So poor Gwen gets, you know, her head pushed into the water. And Abby's a fair bit bigger, so I imagine it's got to hurt a bit too. And Gwen just comes at her with her mouth open, teeth barred, snarling, ready to like just go for the throat. Like, that's her response to stuff when Abby does stuff to her. So, of course, poor Gwen then gets yelled at by me. So, I I feel kind of bad because she gets, the, she gets it twice. She gets it once from Abby doing this thing to her. And then, and then Mommy craps on her too. And 
I've got to give it to him. My dogs, I've never been the type of person, I don't want a robot for uh, an animal, uh, or a pet. I don't want a robot for a husband. Um, you know, I want them kind of have, they have their own personalities. If I tell her to sit, uh, because I have a cookie and I want to give her the cookie and she chooses to run, okay. That's perfectly fine. She can turn around and run. She doesn't get the cookie. Guinevere, off the bed. Oh, God. The cat and the dog are playing with each other. But anyway, um... Yeah, they don't want the cookie. That's fine. They know that they're going to get the cookie if they do what they're told. And if they choose to walk the other way, they know I don't give them the cookie. So they're making a choice. They don't want the cookie. That's fine. But in cases where the situation calls for them listening to me, they know by the tone of my voice that listening is not an option. They need to do what I'm telling them. So they're actually both very good at that. They know when it's serious and it's optional to listen and they can kind of look at you and go, screw you, mommy, I'm not doing that. And Abby even has this little head nod that kind of says, up yours, and she turns around and walks away. I have no idea where she got that from. My husband seems to think she got it from me, but yeah, okay. Gwen. Yes, Gwen. Gwen of yours is a good girl. But um, yeah, so I can't take the chance that Abby's going to decide to be a craphead one day and, you know, kind of go at Gwen and do all these things to her. And she's doing it to try to get her to play. She wants her to play with her. She's doing it, and you can tell from her body language, it's all play. She's like this huge puppy. And it makes me laugh because she's so awkward. Puppies are, if anybody, uh, those of you out there that know puppies, they, you know, they trip over their own feet. They fall into things. Well, that's our Abby, and she's not a puppy anymore, but she is awkward and trips. It is hilarious, but she is playful. And when she goes to jump, she just, it makes a house shake. The floor here on, you can feel her just kind of bounce. And it's it's fun to watch because she's so excited. But if Gwen gets in the way, poor Gwen gets fallen on and everything else, and Abby doesn't mean to have that happen, but it happens. And then, of course, Gwen tries to, you know, rip her throat out. So that's Gwen's reaction to everything when Abby hurts her or does something she doesn't like. So rather than have that be a situation um, when we're not here to control it, um, we just don't let it happen. I just noticed I forgot to... Of the previous color so I'm just going back in and dipping into my container and pulling them and placing them um, yeah so we keep Gwen in a crate because Gwen is smaller and the crates um, a little bit smaller so it's better suited for her size um, we did have a, a second crate that Abby had and Abby actually loved it she go put herself in her crate to sleep. It was her spot to go. But when we moved from the apartment to the house, we just didn't have room in the living room to put it. And I know that sounds kind of funny because we moved from an apartment to a house. So you figured you'd have more space. But it turns out that we... It's about the same size. Our apartment was huge. So it works out to about the same size overall, but um, we didn't have the space to bring both crates and put them together, and I don't want to lock them up in separate rooms. So Gwen's in a crate, Abby's free, 
and the kitten gets locked inside of our office. So there's really not any space in our house where we don't allow our animals to go. Our kitchen is open. So uh, we kind of, I don't want them in there when we're cooking. And they know that, they keep back. Um, away from the immediate area we're in when we're doing that but you know during the day when we're not when we're home if they want to go lay on the kitchen floor they can go lay on the kitchen floor um, the cat thankfully does not go in the kitchen counters um, when we first brought her home um, a few weeks after we had her, she made the mistake of running across the stovetop um, right after my husband had turned it off. And we have a glass stovetop bit. And it had been off, I guess, for about five minutes, but it was still, it was still hot. And she kind of... She moved so fast, she didn't really get badly burnt, but she got a little bit burnt. And we checked out her paw, and she was okay, but she kind of has figured out that running across the counter is not such a good idea, so she doesn't do it anymore, which is great. Because that was my one big turnoff with cats, is that they run on pretty much everything. And she liked the dogs, actually. She knows when mommy means something, and she understands the word no very clearly. So, in our morning routine, generally, when we both have to go to work, is um, my husband usually gets up first, starts getting ready and then has a shower, everything he needs to do, and then he wakes me up. So I generally get to sleep about 45 minutes longer than he does. And I said, and I keep saying I'm really lucky that I get to do that. 45 minutes doesn't seem like a lot, but I've been having a lot of trouble sleeping, so that 45 minutes, it, it's, it's big for me, so... Anyway, uh, then I get ready, and generally, sometime during that time, the cat is so programmed now, it's hilarious. She will come and sit outside the office door and just look at my husband. She will stare at him and be like, come on, it's time for me to go in my room. Mommy's getting ready, so it's time for you to put me in our way. And she'll just sit there and look at him because that's when he generally comes in and gives her food, gives her fresh water, everything else. And she gets some attention time. You know, he'll give her scratches. He, she'll roll over and get her belly rubbed. It's just, it's her ritual now. And it's hilarious because if he doesn't come when she's sitting there looking at him, to come and lock her up she'll wait about five minutes and if he's too slow and he's not ready in that five minutes to come and get her she will literally turn around and run downstairs and then it's oh I've got to get the cat upstairs because she likes to try to escape and we keep her indoors we have we're right on the Humber River, so we have a lot of parkland right next to us. It's actually kind of cool because we're at the back of a townhouse complex. So we're away from the street. We don't have street access to our home. Our car goes in a parking garage. I believe I've said this before. So literally, when I go out in my yard and look, if I look to my left, when I walk out my front door, it looks like we're in the country. It doesn't even look like we're in the city. It's quiet here compared to everywhere else. Um, it's, it's just great. So 
we have a but for that we have a lot of wildlife and honestly the neighbors have cats and they have the cats out in there their cats are I don't know there's one and it's not very nice and I just don't want I don't want mine exposed to that I guess is more the way to describe it she's she's a sweetie and I'm not a big cat person I think I've said that before too my husband's the cat person not me and I'm not crazy about other people's cats it's just not my thing puppies I go nuts for puppies I'm a dog person I go nuts for puppies my husband would argue that and say that I'm not really uh, I'm an animal person <laughs> I like animals in general but as pets I prefer dogs and that's actually until we had the cat I never had one when I was younger my mom was allergic to them so it wasn't an option so yeah so the cat unfortunately I'm the one that seems to deal with all the animals when we get them in their young and or essentially takes care of raising them for lack of a better way to put it so I didn't know what to do with a kitten I knew what to do with puppies but I didn't know what to do with kittens so I just basically treated her like a puppy and because she came into the house very young and was exposed to the two dogs um, that did not go well in the beginning in the beginning um, when we brought her home she actually uh, <laughs> um, our, our girls are the do when I say girls I mean the dogs um, they are general genuinely and I think it's given they're both border collie or partial most Addie's mostly border collie but um, because they work with other animals and it's kind of instinct for them to herd sheep and that um, they're very accepting of other animals and other dogs new things that they are exposed to so they were all excited and curious about this kitten I was carrying home carrying to them and Guinevere off the bed Dog keeps going up on the bed and don't particularly want her up there right now while I'm not in there. So, um, anyway, yeah, so I brought this little kitten home. She was, you know, uh, month and a half old, whatever. Uh, brought her home and the girls, Abby and Gwen, were so, so excited. Like, Mommy, what did you bring us? They were like at the gate, excited, happy, blah, blah, blah. And the kitten went all demon cat on. She puffed herself up and hissed and clawed. And, oh boy, that did not go over well. Gwen is still very... Gwen was still very curious and very... Um, willing to accept. What are you doing? Accept the kitten. Abby, on the other hand, no, kittens freaked out. I was holding her. She clawed and scratched at me. Um, she made me bleed, which Abby is kind of my protector, so... She protects me from everything. And that kind of, I guess, rubbed her the wrong way. So it took her a while to kind of get over that and accept the kitten. She wanted to eat the kitten. She went from being, oh, yay, mommy brought us something cool to, yeah, I'm going to eat you type mentality. She got, she didn't want anything to do with this kitten. She was letting the kitten know that she was boss. 
and oh boy, it was, it was difficult. She literally wanted to go up and nip the kitten every chance she got if, and of course I knew what she wanted to do, so I didn't allow it to happen. It was a it was actually not as bad an introduction as I thought it was going to be. Um, I didn't know how to introduce them, and that's my fault. But uh, one of my friends said, uh, "Do it through a door." So they get to know each other, smelling that under a door. So that's what we did, and we ended up locking the kitten in the office. So she has her litter box and everything, her cat tree and everything is in the office that my husband and I share at home. And that's where she goes during the day. But it took about a week to get them used to each other and that was the matter of coming home at night and just basically we had to go in and constantly visit the kitten because we couldn't let her out. Uh, to run because she was she got to the point where she was actually afraid of Abby and like I said Abby basically wanted to eat the kitten so um, we go in the room my husband and I would take turns and go in and play with the kitten you know we got her one of the sticks with the long furry tail on it and I actually thought this was hilarious because I, like I said, I'd never had a cat. So watching her jump at it and attack it, this tiny little thing, it was, it was just funny to me to watch her throw herself around. Um, and then we would bring the dogs into the room for a few moment, for a few minutes each time and I'd make sure that we had Abby's favorite treats here to reward her when she was being good with the kitten. And we'd have to keep some kind of distance between them and they'd have to look and watch and everything else. So I'd bring cookies in and Abby's actually pretty good because if I'm holding a cookie, she'll just take a bite of it. She's a big dog, but she's very gentle. She's incredibly gentle. She doesn't grab things. Glenn, on the other hand, can be kind of grabby at stuff. But, um, yeah, sit there with cookies and make her work for them and make her sit there and just have her in the room with the kitten and watching us interact with the kitten. So she got the idea that the kitten was, you know, maybe not so bad. So eventually they got to the point where she could be in the room with the cat and she didn't care. So once that happened, it was like, okay, let's try letting the kitten out. And we did. And it was just a matter of making sure that the cat could get out of uh, range. She could get up high enough and get out of you know, Abby's way if Abby decided Abby was going to be a little bit nasty. So once we were sure she could get herself up and out of the way, we set her free. And that took about a week. It took about a week for things to kind of calm down to a level where we were willing to try to let her out and we're sure that she could get up and out if need be. And the way it actually ended up working out was, yeah, the kitten could get up on a, a, a lot of stuff. <laughs> a lot. She's a climber. She could get herself up and out of the way and to safety if it was needed. Unfortunately, or should I say fortunately, it wasn't really needed that she do that because um, Abby had settled down. However... <laughs> The kitten decided that that was a perfect opportunity to jump on the dogs. So she would literally climb up on something and wait for one of the dogs to walk by. And she'd wait and wait and wait. I've seen that kitten wait half an hour in a position for one of the dogs to walk by. Just so that she can spring herself down on them and she just flies and lands on the dogs. 
and then runs off. So, not surprisingly, her and Abby now get along really well. Like, they're both crap heads. Like, they really are. And I'm saying crap heads because I don't want to say the other word, but yeah, they are. They're just, it's just the way they are. And actually, you know what? I kind of like it. They have their own personalities. They do their own thing. You know, they're happy. And that's, that's the important thing for me. That they're happy. I don't want an animal here just to be an animal. I want them to actually have a good life with us. So, you know, when I see things like this, it just kind of makes me laugh and they're happy generally most of the time so that's a good thing so anyway um yeah the kitten waits and flies off on one of the poor dogs walking by and unfortunately it's usually guinevere she doesn't jump on abby as often there's still some kind of kind of timidness there with Abby. Abby's got more respect from the kitten than uh, Gwen does. Poor Gwen takes a beating. She takes a beating from both of them sometimes and I feel kind of bad for her. And then of course she retaliates so either mommy or daddy yell at her when she goes back on them so It's kind of funny, and I think I said that, I don't know if I said this before, but um, my husband will go in the bathroom to have a shower. In our bathroom, it, it's tiny. It is tiny. It's not that big. And you know what? You don't need a big bathroom. You go in to have a shower. You use the bathroom. You know what? It's not. It's not a room you hang out in. You know, it doesn't have to be huge. It just has to be functional. That's it. But it's not that big. And it's hilarious because Guinevere likes to go in there with Daddy in the morning. Daddy gets up. Daddy goes into the bathroom to do his thing and get ready for work. And Guinevere likes to go with him. She sticks to him like glue when he goes in there. And even during the day, if he runs into the bathroom, she wants to go with him. So she goes in and she lays on the floor. And a few minutes later, you hear the kitten at the door and the kitten's crying. The kitten wants in. The kitten wants in because Guinevere's in there. And then sometimes you have Abby who comes upstairs and then Abby stands out the side of the door and Abby's crying because Guinevere and Pixel are inside there with Daddy. So she wants to be with Daddy. So my husband, my husband opens the door and he lets Abby in. And it, it's, it, it just reminds me of like a clown car when when he's had his shower and he comes out because he opens the door and out comes one, out comes the next, and the next one, it's like, it's such a tiny space. It's like, it's like, how do you even move in there? You know, you, you climb in the shower and they take the whole floor. Like Abby by herself takes up most of the space in the bathroom if she walks in there with you and you're having a shower or whatever. You actually have to, I actually have to ask her to leave in order for there to be room for me to get out of the shower when she comes in and she, you know, is standing there when I have a shower. Because if I'm home and I go have a shower, I don't bother closing the door. I leave the door open. And, you know, especially if I'm home alone, because I don't like locking them out of a room. 
Yes, the kitten gets locked in the office, but that's a space she feels. We've we've made these spaces so that the animals feel they're safe. I don't like restricting them from a space with a closed door. Like, it's a forbidden place for them to go. And while we're gone, Abby doesn't have access to the top floor anyway because we put a baby gate up there. And a lot of the reason for that is because she knows how to open doors. She knows how to turn the doorknobs and we're likely to come home and find uh, the kitten free. We've actually come home and found that both dogs are out. Like Abby gets bored during the day and she goes and frees Gwen. Okay, it happens. We don't really freak out. It doesn't happen that often. Oh, excuse me, but it does happen. I've also seen them um, lock the kitten in the crate. The kitten will go downstairs and she'll go into Gwen's crate. And one of the girls come behind and just close the door and they actually will hit the latch over. It's funny because they watch us do it to lock them in. So, And it's probably Abby that does it uh, more than Gwen. Although Gwen is perfectly capable of it. I've seen her do it. But um, Abby's the one that seen, tends to learn things from watching us do them. So that's how she figured out how to open doors. She sits and she watches. And it's like this little light bulb comes on. She thinks about it. And you can tell her little brain is just working at it. And then all of a sudden you see this like, oh, the eyes light up. And she's figured it out. And she gets up and she goes and she does whatever it is she's figured out so it's been a while since we've had one of those moments with her um, it used to happen a lot when she was a younger when she was a puppy she'd be doing stuff and it's like oh you just see this expression come over her face and it's like and she'd get up and she'd leave the room and it's like oh no what did she just figure out so you'd follow her to find out and it's like okay So she's figured out how to um, open her crate and put her, she actually figured out how to open her crate when we had it closed one day when she was younger. She wanted to go in and she figured out how to open it and let herself in. And she let herself into the crate and then after she let herself in, she actually pulled the door closed and it was like, Okay, you want to lock yourself up? Why would you want to lock yourself up? But it made her happy to to be in this crate, and her crate was actually more solid side, so um, it, it was dark in there, so I think she just kind of felt comforted by it. So um, and that was one thing. She figured out how to try kind of stand on her head. She watched the little kid do it and she flipped herself around the living room for like a week. And then all of a sudden this little light came on in her eyes and she went over to a corner and just kind of flipped herself up and it was like, okay. And she wasn't really on her head. She kind of flipped herself up and she kind of went back down on her shoulders, but like the top part of her back behind her neck and that but all four feet were up in the air and her butt up in the air against the wall and that tail was wagging a mile a minute she figured out what she needed to do and for whatever reason I don't know why this was something that she needed to do she wanted to do this it was something that was just needed to be done and she did it she did it for a few months randomly all of a sudden you'd walk into a room and Abby would go flip herself up in a corner but um, <laughs> she got bigger <laughs> she did it less and less so I just don't think uh, I don't think that part of her body can support herself anymore but it, it, it's never been dull so, 
yeah, we keep them separate. It's just, it's a safer option. I do not want to come home and find uh, there's been an accident and one of my animals is dead as a result. You know, um, people tend to forget. You know, they become part of your family. You're like, oh, for us, me and my husband, together, we don't have any children. So literally, these are my babies. And, you know, for some people in that situation, they forget that they're actually dealing with an animal. And I believe that if you're going to take a pet in, you're taking a pet in to be a member of your family. That's my belief. I know not everyone does that, and, you know, that's fine. Uh, it's no judgment, no judging, but I believe if you're bringing an animal into your home, it's a life. It's They're relying on you. They're another dependent. So that needs to be respected. And they need to be, and I believe, to treat them like they're a member of the family in a lot of ways. But they are, they are animals. They're, they're, they're dogs. They're cats. They're not people. But that doesn't mean that they, you know, don't get to sleep on the bed with us. Abby actually surprised us and stayed on the bed with us all night. Uh, the other night, and it was like, oh, God, there's no room. Well, actually, I was okay because she likes to cuddle up against my husband when she sleeps. And it's it's funny because we always laugh and say that she's probably, she's very much my, my dog. You know, it's fun, and I'm sure people who have pets find this. Um, your pet seems to latch on to one person more than anyone else. And that one person is the person they will, like, die for. Or we always joke around and say, like, you know, if we ever had an argument and there was ever anything, ever any serious argument and, you know, where she thought somebody was going to get hurt, like we were going to hurt each other or whatever, which is not going to happen, but... We, or at least, <laughs> it shouldn't happen. Never say never. People crack and do weird things, but, um, yeah. But if that was ever a situation in our house, um, we would joke around and say, my husband says, well, she defend you. She would take a chunk out of me in no time, and she would defend you. That's what my husband says all the time. Yet, she snuggles up, like, when she sleeps, she wants to lay against him. But it's, it's different. So she will cuddle with him, and he's always been the one when they come into the house. I'm the disciplinarian, not him. He didn't just, di like, I was the meanie when she was growing up that was teaching her, like, no. You know, that's bad. This is whatever. I was the one that was running after her constantly going, no. He was the one going, oh, you want a cookie? So, of course, they're like best buds. You know, he sits down on a bench and she climbs up on the bench seat beside him and sits there and she leans right against him so that um, he literally puts his arm around her and they sit there. I have so many photographs of that. Um, somewhere. <laughs> um, that's the problem with everything being digital now. They're always somewhere, and I'm not sure exactly where they are, but yeah. She snuggles up next to him and cuddles with him, and he's like the best thing on the face of the earth. Mommy, mommy's the mean one. So, yeah. But we always joke around saying, even though she's so buddy-buddy with him, and, you know, there's things that he can do to her that, that she just won't let me do. Or if I do it, it, it's a fight. 
I just had one that I saw that I missed, and I can't find it. Oh, this always happens. Anyway, um, yeah, so, oh, there it is. So anyway, um, yeah, he can do things to her that I can't. So, like, for example, if her, if her ears are really bothering her, uh, like, there was a case where her ears were, she was scratching them all the time, and I was trying to get a hold of her ears to look, and she will let me do, she will let me do it, it's not that I can't do it. For whatever reason, I guess because I'm the disciplinarian or I'm the alpha as far as they go. And again, remembering that they're animals. When something's wrong and if it was a pack of animals or a pack of dogs and something's wrong with one and one's not feeling well or whatever, the alpha finding out about that, it's, it's a weakness thing. So, she doesn't let me do things and check things as easily as she will let him do. So, that kind of thing kind of falls on him to make sure because she kind of looks at him like, you're my bud, you're my pack mate. Uh, he's not as threatening to her position, I guess, is the way to put it. Um, to let him do it. I don't know how to describe the relationship. It's funny. But, um, so she'll snuggle up to him in bed. But she will actually sleep. But she'll, she'll go and lay against him, but she won't sleep on him. Which, he doesn't know how lucky he is. I've woken up, and she's been on... Like, a good part of her body has been on me, like, over my chest and that. And I wake up because I literally can't breathe. This is a 130-pound dog, and she's got part of her body on your chest. Well, it doesn't work so well when you try to breathe, when you've got that much weight on your chest. But it's kind of funny because it kind of freaks me out so one morning because I was... I was like, okay, something's wrong here, but you're kind of awake, but you haven't opened your eyes yet, type thing, and I was thinking something was really weird. I wasn't feeling so great. I was having trouble breathing, and I opened my eyes, and all I had was this, this black face in my face. She was laying with her head on my chest, literally almost nose to nose. And I kind of noticed that too. I had this weird feeling like my nose felt really, really strange. It felt kind of, felt kind of wet. And when I opened my eyes and there's Abby staring right at me, it was like, oh God, okay. I kind of screamed a little bit first because I was surprised. But then it was like, okay, <laughs> poor baby. I just, and I scared her. She she jumped up when I did that. And I felt kind of bad. So I persuaded her to lay back down. And she put her head back on my chest. And I kind of scrubbed the top of her head. But she had been asleep on me. And she doesn't do that to my husband. She will even, if she sleeps beside me and against me, when he's not home, like today, I went and had a nap uh, a few hours after he had left, and she'll come up and she'll lay against me, and she'll put her head on my hip or something, and and sleep. She won't do that with him. She will put herself against him, but she won't put anything on him. So he kind of says it's weird the way she does that because, um, or he thinks it's weird the way she does that because she will sleep against him, let him do anything. What are you doing? But she will not, um, actually sleep 
with her head on his chest or anywhere up where he can reach her. She may decide to put her head on his foot, but that's the closest she gets to really kind of snuggling with him when, when they sleep. So, and in some ways I say he's lucky because I've also woken up with her laying across my legs and it was like, oh God, you're... I remember my mom when I was living with them and I had a 65 pound dog at the time and uh, I remember my mom waking me up one morning screaming because she couldn't move her legs she couldn't feel her legs she couldn't move her legs she was just she woke up and she couldn't move and she was in a panic and it was just like oh my god so I was in the next room. I got up. I went running in and I looked and she goes, Oh my God. And I said, what, what are you okay? And she just pointed at the dog. My 65 pound dog had laid over her legs during the night. And I guess the circulation had gone. They had fallen asleep. So she couldn't feel them and she couldn't feel the dog like they were so asleep that she couldn't feel the dog on them. And when she went to go move them because the dog was on her legs, she couldn't move them because of the weight of the dog still holding them down. So she woke up thinking she was paralyzed or something and it was just the dog laying on her. And I actually had that happen to me with Abby. Abby came in. And uh, laid on my legs. And yeah, when I woke up, there was no feeling in my legs. And I had an instant moment of panic. But then for whatever reason, um, my mind clicked back to that moment with my mom. And I looked down and it was like, oh, so this is what that feels like. Nice. So, yeah. It was probably a little easier on me. Because... I had that moment of panic, but then I went, oh, wait, it's probably the dog. And sure enough, it was the dog. And I found another thing that was funny. Um, when we first got her and she was a puppy, um, this is Abby, my, my husband took her out um, to the gas station one day. He just took her for the car ride to get her used to the car. And... Um, I had said to him before he before he will left, make sure you don't leave the keys in the car. Do not leave the keys in the car when you get out to put gas in. Take the keys with you. And he kind of looked at me funny, and I said, "It's just, just take them out of the car because one of my customers." Um, one time it had a little dog and she had double parked on a busy street. And the idea was just to run into the store quickly and run back out. And in the time, her little dog had gotten so excited, he jumped up on the door and he hit the lock. And ever since then, I've been kind of like, oh man, yeah, don't leave the dog in the car by itself. And it was funny because this, ha this had happened with my customer years before that. But it was just something that stuck with me. And Abby was just so rambunctious as a puppy. I, I don't know. It was just this gut feeling that there could be problems. That she was going to get herself into situations and everything else. And sure enough, my husband, like a lot of people's husbands, didn't listen to me. He left the keys in the car. And what happened? Abby jumped up on the door, hit the lock, and locked him out of the car. He goes to get back in the car after going and paying for the gas, and the door's locked. The only good 
thing was the passenger side door was unlocked. She'd only hit the one lock. She hadn't hit the auto lock. She had just actually hit, physically hit the lock on top. So he wasn't completely locked out of the car. But it was kind of, it, it was hard for him. I feel bad cause he actually came home and he looked at me and he says, she locked me out of the car. And I kind of gave him that look like, I, I told you not to do that. <laughs> but, yeah. So that's, like when I say Abby's a joker, Abby's a, Abby can get herself into so much. She is just, she's hilarious. She makes me laugh. Um, another thing she does is, um, puppies tend to grunt. They make this like mm, 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 sound. It's like this just in their throats. And most dogs, as they get older, and not all puppies do it, but a, a fair number do. And some of them don't do it loud enough that you can actually hear it unless you're really listening for it. But we got her from a private shelter and I remember the, the woman who ran the shelter saying, she's my favorite. She's my little grunt. And she did. She had this audible grunt. She sounded like a little chimp all the time. She'd grunt when she's, when she's happy. Uh, apparently it's supposed to be a sign of contentment in puppies when they do that. It's like, a, it's like a cat purring, but she grunts and she never outgrew it. So now when we come home from work, we're greeted by this pouncing, huge dog. And she sounds like, mm, 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 mm. when you come in, she's like, mm, 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 grunt. Or when you scratch the top of her head, like if she came upstairs now, she's downstairs in the living room, but if she came upstairs now and I was scratching the top of her head, she'd start grunting. She'd be like, you know, happy. She just makes that noise all the time. And it's, it's so endearing. It's so cute because it's something that they would do as a puppy and she is, she is so huge. Like, it's something that the small, tiny little thing would do. Not this big, massive dog would do. And she's just, she's adorable. She doesn't realize it. And I think this tends to be a pattern most dog owners would say is, um, little dogs don't realize that they're little. Well, big dogs, they don't realize how big they are. So, it's kind of like they got this opposite view. Every little dog thinks they're like, act like they're huge dogs and they'll be all tough and they'll bark at the biggest dog they can find on the street and act all tough with it. And <laughs> big dogs think they're lap dogs. They think they're tiny and that they can sit on you and that they can, you know, climb on you and you are okay with that and it's like yeah it hurts a little so we have this big bounding dog that's kind of running it kind of reminds me of um the Flintstones where you see the the introduction where Fred comes home and Dino comes out and running at him and knocks him flying well it kind of feels like that sometimes with <laughs> with Abby Jay goes and opens the front door, and boom, out comes the dog. And she's just so happy that you're home and that she's with her people again that, yeah, she's, like, letting Dino free. But it's it's cute. She's got all these cute little ador adorable traits and doesn't realize how big she is. And it's kind of like you look at her and you want to go, oh, you big dummy. But she's not dumb. She is anything but dumb. She is so smart. She figures everything out in relation 
Um, that's the Border Collie. But um, I've always said to my husband, I said, why is it that she seems to get herself into so much trouble? Yet Guinevere, who is the purebred Border Collie, doesn't seem to get herself into that. And what my husband said actually makes total sense is because Abby's a mixed breed, um, that 20, 25% Ridgeback and never makes, uh, calms down the OCD of the Border Collie enough, that obsessive trait enough to, to give her time to figure things out really fast. Like to actually pay attention and watch things so closely that she can figure it out. You know, I remember when we were like, it was awesome teaching her how to sit, how to do anything was so easy. It was like, yep, show her once and she's got it. And you just, you know, show her once and then give her the command with it and do it. And 90% of the time she would just do it when you said it because she assumed that's what you wanted her to do. <clears throat> and then it was just, it was constant after that. Like, sit took one try. And with Abby, and it was like, yep, she sat. Uh, Guinevere, on the other hand, it took her a year. And I just said her name again, so she's like coming over and looking for attention. Hey, babe. What's up? Yeah. Oh, you want to cuddle? You want to cuddle? Oh, my good girl. Um, she, uh, it took a year. It took a year before she would do it. But to get her to crawl across the floor on her belly or to scratch her nose or hide her face, you know, in her paws, that that was like instant with her. So the more difficult tricks were like easy taught. She learned how to do them. It was just, it was simple. Um sit, lie down, not so easy. And I went to, I actually said to our friends that we got her from, because they're breeders, I said, um, have you seen this happen? Like, she takes all the complicated stuff, and it's really simple for her to pick up and do, but to get her to sit or lie down or... She does not like to stay. Uh, even now, she does not like to stay. But the, the, the simple basics that you generally start off teaching a dog, um, she's just not getting them. And it was funny because my husband's friend laughed at us. Or laughed at me. And he says... It's not complicated enough for her. She knows what you want her to do. She knows exactly what you want her to do. It's just almost like the attitude that it it's beneath her to do that because it's just it's basic. <laughs> and it was it was ridiculous cuz it took so long for her to to do it. And it was almost like, I get it that it wasn't that she was stupid or wasn't whatever. I, I just wasn't challenging her enough. So she didn't want to do it because it wasn't, it wasn't enough of a challenge. Once we started making things challenging for her, oh my God, she took to it like, she takes them like crazy. But she's easily distracted still. Something will happen, and she just gets full focused on it. But that is, again, a Border Collie trait. Um, 
we had to teach her not to chase wheels. Uh, that, that was fun. That took a while. The obsessive need to chase anything that went by on wheels. Although she didn't want to chase cars. She just wanted to chase people on, uh, rollerblades, skateboards, bicycles, you know, that kind of thing. Um, motorcycles were things that she wanted to try to go after. Um, just, just general, anything with wheels except for cars. So that was, that was an interesting thing. It was, uh, that took a while to curb that obsession to, to chase things but again it's I'm the disciplinarian so it was generally me telling her no and it was it was so funny because I actually told my husband I said you have to learn to be more aggressive and he says but why and I said you don't have to and then he started yelling at them and I said no 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 you don't have to yell at them you just have to, like, it has to be like, no. It can't be, no. It can't sound wishy-washy. It has to be like, no. Not, no. You actually have to sound like you mean it. And he took that to mean that he should yell at them. <laughs> so instead of, it would still be this kind of pathetic no. It would just be louder. So, and I love him. He just, it, it just isn't in his nature to, to be that way. And it actually used to really frustrate me when we were first living together because we'd have an argument and I'd be, I'd be so furious about something like, like something would bug me so much that we'd be arguing about it and he'd just be kind of I'd be I'd be mad about something and just kind of like going at it and he'd just kind of be like yeah okay and it just used to fire me up even more because he was just so so calm and sedate about it and was like <laughs> it was like oh my god it, it, and it sounds so stupid now when I when I look back at it that uh, I actually had an argument with him about the way he argues when we first got together um I was so upset I'm like you know what I, I'm upset about enough about this that that I'm telling you off about it. And your attitude in return is okay. Just okay. And that's just the way he d did things. And it was just like, no, no, no. If I care about this enough, that I'm getting this upset about it. And you're just sitting there and you're, I, I felt like he was brushing me off. It's like, if I feel strongly enough about this, that I want to fight about it. Damn it, we're going to fight about it. We're going to accept this little wishy-washy. Okay. Or he'd answer me, or he'd have some kind of answer for it. And it would just be this, like, yeah, whatever kind of tone response. And it was just, it just fired me up even more. It, it was ridiculous. So that's why my husband handles things. So even when he yells, or he's saying no to the dogs, he was saying it, he would just say it louder, but it would have the same tone. So they just kind of look at him like, um, no. And unfortunately, because, uh, because I made such a big deal about fighting and arguing and, you know, if we're gonna argue about something, the, just argue about it. Don't don't take the yeah kind of attitude about it and just kind of 
calm and whatever. If, if you're going to argue, argue. I, and the worst thing is, is I know you don't accomplish anything when you argue and you fight. You accomplish something when you actually sit and talk. But sometimes just that emotion, just you have to get past that. Just, oh, and get it out and vent it. And the fact that he wouldn't do that was just kind of like, yes, Guinevere. Would just kind of be like, oh, my God, can we just like get past this? So unfortunately, um, I kind of, kind of taught my husband how to get that kind of thing out. And there are times I look at it now and I'm going, oh boy, why, why, why did I do that? Because we can have some pretty good arguments. And now it's like, now he fights back. And before it was like, he didn't fight back. Now, now he'll fight back. So it's like, great. I asked for this, and I remind myself of that all the time, that this is what I asked for. I asked for him to argue back if I felt strong enough about something. And, you know, there's times where I'm upset about something, and he's got a more laid-back approach to things than I do. Um, I'm very much like, um, I need it done and I need it done now and I need it done this way. And he's very much kind of got the attitude that nothing is that important. And that kind of sometimes can be, ooh, that can really get me going. And... Yeah. So now, if I get that way, it used to be before he just kind of go, yeah, and just kind of walk off and ignore it, which is, which is fine. But now, now he doesn't do that. Now he tells me off about it. If I turn around and say, but, and he goes, look, you've brought it up like four times. So give it up. And he'll just tell me flat out to give it up. I'll do it later. I'm not doing it now. And in some ways, I'm kind of like, okay. Um, and it puts him in, and, and then now it puts him in a bad mood. Um, and he can stay like that for a while. And I still, I have to remind myself that this is what I asked for. I asked for somebody that fought back, that cared enough to want to fight back. Because it just felt like he didn't care about it anything before and now it's like oh what did I do but he's still he's still very calm and compla complacent with the dog he's still he's still their bud um, although there are times where I've got to hand it to him he gets that tone and they know that there's no messing with daddy at that moment and even the cat, even the cat knows there's no messing with daddy at that moment. Um, I remember one time and I think I might've mentioned this before too, is, and this happens, it happens once in a blue moon here, but it's happened more than once. Um, Pixel, that's the cat and Gwen get along so well. Um, they play together. The cat plays with Gwen and she sleeps with Abby. That's kind of the dynamic they worked out together. So, um, and one morning, Gwen was in the bathroom with my husband. The cat wanted in. And all of a sudden, I just hear this, this god-awful noise come out of the cat. Like, it, she just screeched. And then my husband, you hear my husband, hey! And he's yelling at them. He's just, just, just hey! And this, like, no-nonsense tone comes out of him. And it's just like, okay. I was, I was, I was impressed. I'm like, he, he got it. He nailed it. And then... 
And then all of a sudden I hear this yelp come out of Gwen. And again, hey, and it stopped. It just all stopped. So there was this noise from the cat, him like telling them off. And then this, this noise from Gwen, this like screech from Gwen and then him telling them off again. And it just stopped it, at that moment. It stopped. So basically what had happened was, um, Gwen had sat on the kitten. She had sat on her, stepped on her. She'd hurt her and made her squawk. So my husband just basically crapped on her for it. Um, you know, be more careful type thing. Watch because she, she doesn't. Um, she has no grace. She walks over people. She doesn't care. She steps on things. She just, she's so focused on whatever it is she has her little mind going on at the moment. She doesn't care who she walks over, pushes through, or whatever. She just, she just does it. And she's not that heavy, so it's usually not too big of an issue. Um... But for the kitten, who's like, at this time was like a pa like two pounds, a 30-pound dog stepping on you, yeah, that's got to hurt. So, so my husband yelled at them, and I, when they came out, I asked, um, what happened? And he says, well, first, one stepped on Pixel, and then and Pixel turned around and bit her. She bit her for stepping on her, and it was, it made me laugh because it was like, it just, it just reminded me so much of the dynamic between Abby and Gwen, where Abby will do something to her, and she's just meaning to do it in fun, or she's not intending to be rough for anything, but it's just, it's pure size. It's a pure size issue uh, between them, like comparing the big dog to the smaller dog and then the smaller dog to the kitten. Like, I'm so glad that Abby is actually surprisingly for her being so clumsy. Like she trips over her own feet. She is so careful when it comes to everyone else. Like it's very rare that Abby steps on people or anything. She's so, so careful. Like, she'll trip over her own feet trying to avoid stepping on someone. So it's just the fact that they're so different. But it's it's like Abby does something to Gwen, and Gwen retaliates. And in this case, Gwen did something to the kitten, and the kitten retaliated. The difference being... Is usually it's Gwen that's get, uh, doing the retaliating, and usually we can call her off, so nothing happens. Like, you know, she'll go at Abby, and we'll yell at her, and she'll stop instantly. Like, it's like a freeze, and she does it. She is so good in that respect that it's, once she hears that tone, it's like, no, that's it. It is an instant freeze moment, and whatever it was she was doing, she does stop. Like, there's no worry about, um, oh my God, get up and run because they're going to fight, and we have to break them up. No, you tell her off, and she stops. It's like instant. We don't actually physically have to get involved, which is great. There's a lot of cases where once an animal like that ha or a dog has it in their mind that they're they're going to go after something, no matter what you say, they're still going to do it. You physically have to go break them up. With ours, no. Uh, not with one. She instantly will come back. We've had her run across our... She likes to jump our fence in the yard and um, go try to herd the geese on the soccer field beside us and it's actually kind of cute when you think about it because she's purely running on instinct 
And it'd be really funny to see what she could actually do, how strong her instinct really is. But given the fact that there's times where there's like five, 600 geese out on that field and it's just her and she's small, um, those geese would win. Like those geese would seriously, if they all decided to turn on her, she would be, she wouldn't stand a chance with these geese. So, it's kind of like, yeah, but they say a lot of Border Collies, once they're in herding mode, they're hard to, to call back, especially when they're not, when they're not trained to do it. Like, we did not take her to a herding school and say, uh, give her commands and channel this in any sort of form. It's, this is just what she naturally would know to do and her response to it. It's pure instinct. So to call her off from that and have her literally, she will be mid stride and she will flip around mid stride and come back. You literally see her turn in the air. It, she is phenomenal for that response. So I'm almost done this area. Just a few more colors left to go. And I have rambled on about the animals forever. Um, they're my babies. I can do that. I can ramble on about my babies forever. And they always, and they, and they keep things interesting around here. Like there's never... There's never dullness with them around. They're always doing something or getting into something or whatever. Like, they are, and I don't want anyone to think they're bad or that we don't control them. It's just, they're, fun, they're funny antics. It's, it's a different level, and I find... Now, owning these two, I've always had two dogs in the past, but usually one's been mine and one's been my mom's. So there's been two around. Um, and it was always the unspoken thing that even though mine, when I was living with her, um, the, the dogs would stay with her when... Um, when it came time for me to move out because um, it was the only home they, the one had known and actually what happened was I actually ended up moving out the same day we actually had her had her put down and that was sad but um, yeah I was actually moving out and I had actually gone back home and stayed there for two weeks uh, prior to when we were taking the dog in to have her put down. Um, we had actually made that appointment a month in advance. We knew something was wrong with her. Um, and we didn't want to... We kind of worked it out basically as soon as I said there was... I knew there was something wrong with her. We had taken her to the groomer, and um, we usually had her cut down for the for the warmer weather. She had a huge, thick, long coat, and it was it was more comfortable for her. But generally, coming out of the winter, a lot of dogs tend to, especially when it's really cold, tend to put on more weight during the winter. And, um, or a few pounds during the winter, like, you know, five pounds on a dog that's 65 pounds to start with, uh, you know, that's a lot. And, it, you know, you work it off them in the spring a lot because they're not usually as active in the winter. But when we took her to the groomer and she came out and she was so, you could see how much weight she had lost. And we took her in March, so it, there was still snow on the ground. 
but it was starting to warm up a bit, but it was like, no, sorry. It was, it, it was a, it was April. It was April. We took her towards the end of April. The weather was just starting to get nice. Um, there was still was some snow on the ground, but it was warming up, up a lot really fast that year. So we took her to the groomers, um, earlier than we usually would to have her trimmed down so that she wasn't too hot. And it was the fact that she was getting older. She was 13. Um, I didn't want her to, I didn't want her to have to deal with the heat so much being older if we could avoid it. So when I took her to the groomer and I went back later and picked her up and she was so much, so thin, I knew something was wrong. I knew something was wrong because she was eating like she was eating like normal, but she wasn't, she wasn't maintaining her weight. And this was at a period of time where I expected her to weigh more and she didn't. So it was kind of, it was kind of a case where I knew something was not going to be right. So we called the vet and we actually booked an appointment and I said, I explained to the vet what the situation was and they said, even probably without doing tests in all likelihood, given her age, she probably had cancer or something in her body and you know, so we decided that we were going to make the date to have her put down a month later or roughly a month later. And I talked to the vet and I made the appointment and they basically said, okay, if anything happens between now and then, and it needs to be sooner, call us and we'll work something out. Because just from what I described, they had seen, they had figured that was a month might be pushing it. It might be too long. And it almost was. There was a couple of times where she actually freaked us out and we thought we were going to have to take her in sooner, but she pulled out of it and was fine. So we basically made the appointment so that we didn't push her to the point where she was in a lot of pain, uncomfortable. My mom had um, had her dog put down a few years before that, and she got sick. It was, she ended up with cancer. Actually, she was acting fine. And then all of a sudden, one day, she started sneezing. And when she sneezed, there was blood everywhere. Like, she sneezed blood everywhere. And she was a tiny, she was a small dog. She was only like 15 pounds. So this little thing was just sneezing and blood was everywhere. And this happened on a Friday night and we were like, oh my God, okay, we, we have to take her to the vets. But it happened like at 11 o'clock at night and she sneezed once or twice and then it stopped, but she was running around like, like nothing was wrong and the next so we said we'd wait until the next morning and see what happened and the next morning she was fine and then again we hit that evening and she started sneezing again and blood and we said okay tomorrow we got to take her but when we got up in the morning and this would have been a Sunday morning again she's running around and she's playing like a puppy so it was, it was kind of confusing. It's like, what do we do here? You know, we don't have an appointment. We can book an appointment. We can take her to an emergency vet. We can, we have options, but you know, she keeps, all of a sudden she's fine. So it's, what do we do? And we just decided we'd wait. My mom called the vets and made an appointment um, for Monday. 
that's what she ended up doing. We didn't just ignore the fact that this was happening. We actually called the vet and booked an appointment. But it didn't seem to be as severe as it was. Um, my mom was only working part-time. At the time, she had actually retired uh, from her regular job and it decided to get a part-time job to keep her busy. So she finished at one o'clock, came home, and actually ended up taking the dog to the vets earlier than her appointment. She actually got home um, at 1.30, and I believe her appointment wasn't until four, and she actually called the vets and said, um, can I bring her now? Apparently, when she got home, I was at work. Um, things were really bad. Uh, the dog, all of a sudden, was it, she wasn't running around. She was having trouble standing. She, she wasn't good. It was, all of a sudden, she went from playing and bouncing around to just done. She was she was just lethargic. She didn't want to do anything. So my mom called the vet. They made arrangements to bring her in early. Um, I wish I'd been there because I feel bad for my mom doing this on her own. Um, she said, well, she was driving to the vets. Usually this dog hated going to the vets. She would start screaming in the car as soon as we pulled onto one street in the area because she knew she was heading towards the vets and the funny thing was is my aunt used to live in the same area so even when we were going to my aunt's house as soon as we pulled onto the street this one main street the dog would recognize where she was and she'd start freaking out she starts screaming and she'd scream all the way to my aunt's house and that was like another good five minutes in the car. But she, it, this time my mom said when she took her to the vets and she turned onto the street, there was, there was no sound from her. She was, she was silent. And my mom knew at that moment that it was not good. Um, my mom knew then that she was not coming out of the vet's office with the dog. And I, I feel bad for her because she had to go through that and do that by herself. And she loved that dog so much. So, um, we decided we were going to make the appointment beforehand and we were not going to, to let this one go to the same point. We weren't going to let her suffer. We weren't going to let her be in pain um, or as much of it as we could avoid. And the vet thought that that was an appropriate decision. Like, our, our vet wouldn't have agreed to it if they didn't think that we were doing the right thing. It wouldn't have been, um, yeah, your dog's getting old. Just bring her in and put her down. He, they would have never accepted that from what we had described and her age and that uh, they were they were pretty sure what was wrong with her and they actually prepared us for bringing her in sooner than what we had said but we made the appointment so that we had something in place so we couldn't ke kept saying um, keep saying oh, maybe maybe tomorrow or we'll go get her checked out tomorrow. Or, no, she's, let's see how she's doing tomorrow. Let's see what's going on. It, we avoided that. We put a plan in place so that it was time to spend with her. To, you know, show her how loved she was and everything else before she went to the vets and we, we spoiled her rotten for that last month and because we knew what was coming and what we were doing we we were more 
we were more liberal with things than we would have been. Like, um, her favorite treats. <laughs> she got so many. So many. And in the in a normal normal life for her, you know, you can't do that. You can't just give them as many of the treats as you know there has to be a limit because there's consequences. If you give them so much of something, um, one, you'll make them you can make them sick. Two they're going to pack on weight like crazy and it's not going to be healthy for them. Well, given the fact that, you know, we were, we were basically saying, buddy, in a month you're, you're done. We're, we're taking you to the vets and whatever, knowing that you were taking her to the vets and having her put to sleep a month from then, it's like, you know what? You want some of these extra cookies? Here. Normally, I'd give you two. Here. You can have five. Because you like them so much. Oh, you want this bone? Okay, well, instead of giving you this small piece every day, I'm going to give you a little bit bigger piece every day. Like, just, just stuff that she really, really enjoyed. Because in the end, there really is no... There really was no consequence. Um, and the vet had looked at her and just from looking at her suspected that ex exactly what we had described was the case. So um, he didn't even think she was going to make the month. So we spoiled her. We gave her everything she could possibly um, want. You know, we we cooked a steak, and it's like, here, uh, I gave half the steak to the dog. You know, like, she got stuff that, special stuff. We made sure we made every moment count. You know, I, I spent as much time as I could sitting there cuddling her, you know, giving her that extra extra attention not that she didn't get attention before but it was like it was so focused it was so focused on her and in the end I feel that we did the right thing because she had had a couple of episodes um the week before we took her to the vets where she had had massive seizures and the vet said she probably had a stroke a partial stroke during it so it was it was time and again when she went into the vet's office um, when we took her in for the appointment we were the last appointment of the day so there was no rush um, it was it, it was a different a different attitude with the dog she was calm. She was relaxed. She was like, you know, things that she would normally have fussed about because she was a nervous dog. Um, she didn't. There was just almost this thing like, okay, I know why I'm here and I know what you're doing and yeah, I'm ready type air, thing in the air. And oh man. She she broke my heart. I I couldn't even I couldn't even tell the vet to go ahead when it was time. And and it's not that I didn't want the vet to go ahead. It's not that I was having second thoughts about what I was doing because I knew what I was doing was the best thing for her. I was just so so devastated at the fact that I was doing this, um, that I wasn't going to have her anymore, that I actually couldn't say to the vet to go ahead, which I'm kind of glad my mom was there for, because my mom just said, yes, do it. Yes, we're ready. And it was actually, it was so peaceful. They, she just, they gave her one injection and she just, she just went. And I was holding her and cuddling her. And 
yeah, I, uh, took me four years to get another dog after that. My husband wanted one so bad. And he kept handing me puppies. Every time we passed somewhere, we were, you know, a pet shop or something. Or people had puppies for adoption. Or if he had friends that had puppies that were, you know, giving them away. He kept handing them to me. And I just, I couldn't do it. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to do it. Again, so... Uh, it took me four years to decide, and I just decided out of the blue, I saw an ad on Kijiji, and that little face, I just, oh my God, I just absolutely just, I fell in love with her. So we went, we traveled two and a half hours to go pick her up, and we did it on uh, Thanksgiving weekend, and yeah. And I said to my husband, I said, I thought the last one was bad. I said, she, she's going to destroy me. She is going to totally destroy me. And she's getting older now and her face is starting to go white. And I look at her sometimes and it makes me sad because she's a big dog and she's so She's, um, seven. And that's getting up there for a dog that big. I'm hoping, I'm hoping we got another five or six years with her. But, I don't know. It's just watching her face go so white and everything else. I know she's getting older. And I, I know what's eventually lurking in the end and... And I want to make sure that I'm hoping I'm strong enough to make the decision again to do the right thing for her. She's been awesome for me. Um, I have a bunch of medical problems and um, some of the treatments for those problems have actually triggered seizures. She knows when I'm going to have a seizure before I know. And she, she warns me and she actually takes care of me. And I say that because, um, there's times where I ignore her. Like I don't clue into what she's doing or I'm so distracted by something else. And probably it's part of it. It's probably her size. Um, and the instinct from the border collie, um, the hurting instinct, she will actually force me. She will push me in whatever direction she wants me to be in. If she thinks I'm in trouble, she will push me to a bedroom, uh, to the bed. She will push me to a couch. She will push me somewhere and make me sit. And when I say she will push me, I mean, like, like she puts her full body weight behind me and shoves like she pushes me in that direction where it's a case of you have to go or she's knocking me out. So I've tried resisting her pushing me and all that's resulted in is her actually knocking my legs out from under me and putting me on the floor. She will put me in a position where she thinks I'm safe and then she will guard me. And, uh, it's actually been so bad that there's been times where I've actually had seizures and she's pushed me somewhere and I've gone to where she's told I've gone where she's led me. And then she will leave me to go get my husband if he is home. She will go get my husband and she will bring my husband to me. The only problem is she does that and then and then she guards me. So she comes and she brings him to show him. But then um, he has to kind of persuade her to, to let him come to me. To like touch me. Because she wants to make sure that everything's okay. 
she just wants him to kind of know what's going on but it's kind of like daddy i'm protecting mommy so he has to kind of persuade her to move aside so you know she's gonna the bond with her is so much stronger than it was with the old dog and i didn't think that was imp even possible so um because we had rescued the other one and she was terrified of people and all of a sudden one day she accepted us and it was the most amazing feeling on the face of the earth but there was six months where that dog decided she wanted nothing to do with us and I thought we were gonna have a problem I thought we were gonna have a dog for its entire life that didn't want to have anything to do with its owners didn't want to interact, didn't want to do anything, but like I said, when you choose to bring an animal home, um, it's part of your family. Just because she decided she didn't want to have anything to do with us, um, she wasn't aggressive, she wasn't, you know, nasty, and we brought her home as a five-week-old puppy, but she got beaten before we brought her home. That was the older dog, and, um... She didn't trust people. So when she decided to trust us, that was that was a huge thing and you know, kind of click and you kind of get really attached and that was that was rough when we when we lost her, but this with Abby is totally different. Like she she has always interacted. She takes care, she protects. If I'm not feeling well, she stays with me. Like, she constantly will guard me and protect me. So, the bond there is so much stronger that I know one day she is gonna, she's going to destroy me. And I just hope that when that time comes that I am strong enough to do the right thing for her and not hesitate to do what needs to be done and make sure she doesn't suffer because um, because I don't want to lose her so but right now she's downstairs lounging on the couch sleep in probably with the kitten because the kitten's not up here anymore and just waiting for daddy to come home so you know what you gotta love them and enjoy them while you have them and <sighs> mourn them when they're gone anyway um oh god we're at two hours this is a long one uh, i didn't realize how much time went by and i was just rambling away so I'm going to cut this off here. I'm going to continue this in um, time lapse again. Uh, maybe before I'm finished the piece, I will do another drill with me with this. Like I said, I'm going to do all of this um, on camera. And I'm only going to use the single tray, single uh, drill tip, and the tw and a set of tweezers I basically am doing this um, except for the containers with the attitude that you can basically start from nothing you don't need the fancy tools that can come out of the box and this is what you can do um, containers it's easier for me to get them back in the containers than it is for me with the bags. Um, I tend to have issues with my hands right now, so that's the main reason for using this. And the only other difference really is the light pad. And the reason for the light pad as well is to make it more visible for you to see as well as for me to see. With the light pad off, this doesn't show up quite as well. 
so it's make it more visible for the video as well as make it a little bit easier for me to see that I don't have to kind of lean over it so far. So anyway, um, that's it for this one. I'm going to, like I said, continue on with this in time lapse um, in another video. Thanks everyone for watching. Hopefully you got a lot done on your own pieces. Um, if you're new, hopefully you're enjoying the, the process. Um, yeah, the purpose of a lot of the drill with me is to just kind of have somebody doing something and talking with and sharing the time with it. It's, it's background noise. I, I'm constantly watching stuff from Brandy, Abstract Crafter, when she does a drill with me, uh, Donnie, when she does them, uh, so Teresa, I love it when they do drill with me, um, Ella, because I can just sit back and do this, and it's like somebody else is doing it with you, and that's the purpose of doing these videos, is to have somebody else doing it with you. I just wish there was a way to have, I wasn't rambling at you the whole time. Like, you know, I had feedback and conversation on the other side, but that's why they make videos. So anyway, everyone, happy diamond painting. Um, if you haven't already done so, hit the subscribe button below. It'll be that way. Um liked it give it a thumbs oops thumbs up uh, if you really feel the need to you can give it a thumbs down leave any comments or questions in the comment area below and I'll do my best to get back to them as quickly as possible um, and until next time have a great day evening uh, morning, wh whatever it is, wherever you are when you're watching this and the time you're watching this, uh, keep up with the diamond painting. Um, yeah, and if, if you're doing stuff of your own and you want to share, in the comment section below, uh, send a link uh, to photos or whatever and I'll, I'd love to stop by and take a look at them. Anyway, have a good day. Bye. And bye until next time. Hi everyone, welcome back at the end of the drill with me. I know that video is longer, so I'm going to cut this short. We only have one more time lapse coming up from the videos that I kind of messed up on, and then we'll be back on track and finishing the mosaic horses. And yay! I hate it when I screw up things and I don't get them in order, and that was the only one that I really kind of... I'm going to have like that because when I found those videos, I found all the other videos. So we're, we're good for a while. And like I said, I'm covering up the current project because I don't want everyone to see it. Yeah, I fell off the wagon. I started something new. But I'm still going to go back and complete all the other paintings as well. This is just what I feel like working on today. So... Thank you for watching. Please hit the like and subscribe if you haven't already. And the notification bell so you get notified when I randomly post videos. And once again, ooh, power zoom on my hands. And my band-aid, my nasty band-aid. Yep. Anyway, see you in the next video.